Hello everyone, Jinx here, one of the Monster Hunter Math Guys. So, in today's video, I want to talk about an extremely common misconception as well as build mistake I see so many people doing. And that mistake is prioritizing raw like attack boost in your builds. In other words, attack boost is a trap. However, this is a fairly lengthy discussion. So, before we dive on in, I want to quickly remind you that we do have a Twitter where we post updates about all of our videos as well as other things we're thinking about. And Tuna does, of course, have a Twitch where he streams almost every single day. In fact, as soon as this video goes live, he will be live on Twitch, so be sure to go show him some love. Alright, so why is Attack Boost a trap? Now, don't get me wrong, Attack Boost, especially Attack Boost 4, is fairly good. However, it is not your top priority. If your intention is to increase the damage of your build, you should not be prioritizing attack boost over much more important damage skills. And these damage skills are Weakness Exploit 3, Crit Boost 3, and Critical Eye 7. Now, you may not need all 7 Crit Eye if you're using a higher affinity weapon, but the point is you want to hit 100% affinity with Crit Boost 3 before you even consider slotting in Attack Boost. Far, far too often do I see builds that prioritize getting Attack Boost 7 and do not have any Crit Boost in the set whatsoever. Now, we have actually already discussed this exact subject in one of our original Monster Hunter Math Core videos talking about EFR. And that video was made back in Base Monster Hunter World when Raw was actually stronger than it currently is. Back then, Attack Boost 4 was a lot more attractive than it is in Iceborne. See, critical modifier skills like Critical Eye have actually gotten buffed in Iceborne. Critical Eye itself now gives you 40% affinity at level 7, and every single level gives you 5% instead of having the weird 3, 6, 10 thing it used to have. Technically, Weakness Exploit is worse if you don't soften a monster part, but either way, it's still horribly efficient. Crit Boost is exactly the same as it was previously, but because it multiplies with Critical Eye and Critical Eye got buffed, it did technically get a little efficiency buff. Conversely, raw attack skills got weaker. Technically, the only one that actually got a direct nerf was non-elemental boost because it's 5% of base true raw instead of 10%. However, every single raw attack skill, so attack boost, agitators attack components, peak performance, resentment, etc. Despite none of these actually getting direct numbers nerfed, they are all weaker in Iceborne. With the exception of percent raw modifiers like Fortify or Heroics. But why are they weaker? What has changed? Well, it comes down to the difference between additive and multiplicative bonuses. So in order to explain this properly, let's first revisit what EFR or Effective Raw is. It is imperative to understand how the formula for Effective Raw works in order to understand why Attack Boost is a trap in Iceborne. Now, I could just tell you to go watch that old video so you can know what EFR is, but honestly, it's super old and kinda cringy, so let's just briefly cover it. So, your effective raw is a measure of what your average raw damage is on a build. It basically accounts for every single variable within your build that determines what the raw damage on your attacks will look like. And the reason why I say it's on average is because it also accounts for your critical hit chance with a standard deviation. In other words, if you have 75% affinity, it assumes that you will crit 75% of the time. Now, the way you get your EFR is you take your true raw multiplied by your crit modifier, multiplied by your sharpness modifier, and then multiplied by any miscellaneous bonuses like class bonuses. These bonuses are things like longsword spirit levels, power files on switch axes, that sort of stuff. These things are multipliers and they stay consistent on your build regardless of what you throw in it, so we're not really going to worry about those. So first off, your true raw is just your attack stat but without your bloat modifier. In case you didn't already know, every single weapon in this game has a bloat modifier. Modifier. Basically, your true roll gets multiplied by this to show your attack stat in game. I assume the reason why there are attack bloats in the game is to make the heavy hitting weapons feel like they have more attack stats and vice versa for the lighter hitting weapons. But in terms of damage calculations in game, it only cares about true roll. Also, just to clarify, the attack stat from attack skills in game are true roll. So, one level of attack boost gives you three true roll, two levels of attack boost gives you six true roll, etc. 
Your crit modifier is just a combination of your affinity as well as your critical boost level. So basically what you do is you take the crit damage you have based on your critical boost level, you subtract one from that and multiply it by your affinity and then add one to the total. So just as an example, let's say you have critical boost three, which is a 1.4 times critical damage multiplier. And let's say you also have 80% affinity. So you subtract one from the 1.4 and you get 0.4. Multiply that by 0.8, which is your affinity, and that gives you 0.32. Add 1 to that and boom, you have your critical modifier. So crit boost 3 with 80% affinity is essentially a 32% increase on DPS on average. Finally, we have sharpness modifiers. Basically, every different level of sharpness gives you a different multiplier on your total damage output. In Iceborne, for purple, this is a 1.39. For white, this is 1.32. For blue, this is 1.2. For green, it's 1.05. And for yellow, it's going to be a 1.0. As you can see, the DPS increase jumps from green to blue and from blue to white, which is why white at minimum is pretty much considered mandatory for any build. All right, so now we have our EFR, and our EFR is the only component of the damage formula our build affects. The other two components are your motion values and the hits and value of the monster you're hitting. Motion values are basically the percentage of damage that each attack for each different weapon deals. These are locked to every attack so we can't affect them with our builds. And then the hit zone value is just the percentage of damage a monster's body part takes to your particular damage type. For example, the training pull has an 80 hit zone value to every single raw damage type, meaning it takes 80% of the damage you deal. Now we can increase the hit zone value by softening it, but in terms of your builds, there's nothing you do to affect it. Multiply these three together and boom, you have the number that pops up on screen when you hit a thing. Okay, we understand how EFR works, so why does this make attack boost a trap? So let's examine the differences between critical modifier and more true raw. So the critical modifier and your true raw are both multiplicative with each other. What this essentially means is if you have the same critical modifier and add extra raw into your build, the percent of damage increase that the critical modifier gives you stays exactly the same. So if for example we have a 1.4 critical modifier and 100 true raw that's still a 40% increase to 140. And if we have the same 1.4 critical modifier with 200 true raw it's still a 40% increase to 280 EFR. Conversely attack boost is additive to itself and so is critical hit modifier skills. So for example if you started off with 100 true raw added 10 to it that's a 10% increase. However, if you start with 200 true raw and add 10 to that, that's only going to be a 5% increase. Additive bonuses get incrementally worse the more of that base stat you already have. But critical modifier skills are also additive to themselves. So if you have 100% affinity with no crit boost, getting crit boost 1 brings you to a 1.3 mono from 1.25, which is a 4% increase. But going to critical boost 2, which puts you at a 1.35 modifier with 100% affinity, is only a 3.8% increase. So if they're both additive with themselves and multiplicative with each other, why is attack boost and true raw so much worse. Well, that's because there are basically no outside sources of affinity or crit boost for your critical modifier. The only way to increase your critical hit damage is with the critical boost skill. And the outside sources of affinity are unreliable and very rare, such as the affinity songs on Hunting Horn and Affinity Booster. Realistically, we can't really rely on any of these because Affinity Booster lasts for a very little time and Hunting Horns are almost always better off running an attack up extra large instead of affinity up. Conversely, there is so much true roll bonuses you can get from outside of your builds. So first up, in Master Rank, the general meta weapons hit 270 to 290 raw, so let's just say 280. Then on top of that, you get plus 15 from eating for food attack large, you get 7 for mega demon drug, and you get 10 each for demon powder and might seed. And you get a total of 15 between the power, talent, and charm you keep in your inventory. This means a post-story master rank build before you even really hit endgame already has 337 true raw in it before you even account for skills. And this doesn't even include non-elemental boost, which pops this up by about another 14 points or so. Now, let's take the 21 true raw from attack boost add it to this 337 and see what the percent increase is. That's right, attack boost 7 is a 6.2% increase in your DPS. That is less than a 1% increase 
increase per skill level. Now, of course, this doesn't account for the 5% affinity you get from it, which does push it up a little bit higher, but you're still looking at a sub 7% DPS increase. Now, instead, let's look at what critical eye 7 would get us. So let's assume that we have weakness exploit 3 and crit boost 3, but no crit eye. So this with 50% affinity on softened weak points ends up hitting a 1.2 critical modifier. Now, if we take the 40 extra affinity from critical eye, add that in, we get a 1.36 critical modifier. Now, 1.36 over 1.2 is a 13.3 repeating percent increase in DPS. That is twice what you get from attack boost 7. And because of how additive bonuses work in that they get worse the more of the stat you already have, if you are not hitting softened weak points, critical eye gives you an even higher percent increase in total damage. Crit Boost 3, Weakness Exploit 3 when not hitting softened weak points gives you a 1.12 critical modifier. Now if you throw in Critical Eye 7, you then hit 70% affinity, putting you at a 1.28 critical modifier. Now 1.28 over 1.12 is a 14.3% increase in DPS, which is even higher. And yes, it gets even higher if you're whiffing weak points. That means if you aren't a skilled speedrunner and only hitting softened weak points and you whiff quite often, it's actually even better to run crit I7 than it is attack boost 7. And now you may be thinking, but what if I don't have crit boost at all? Well, just weakness exploit 3 puts us at a 1.125 critical modifier. Now if we add in critical I7, that puts us at a 1.225 critical modifier which works out to an 8.9% increase in damage, still much higher than attack boost 7. And yes, if you whiff weak points and soften weak points, this does get even higher a percentage increase, just like we previously discussed. And keep in mind, this is multiplicative with true raw, meaning that you get this exact same percentage increase in damage, regardless of whether you're using a level 1 weapon or an endgame rarity 12 weapon. Oh, and Critical Eye is significantly easier to drop in terms of level 4, level 1, and combination decos. Oh, and because Master's Touch is meta again for a lot of different weapons, crit also means more sharpness. So yes, this is why attack boost is a trap. It is an additive bonus already put on a gigantic value we already have, so it just gets weaker and weaker. In fact, in base Monster Hunter World, when we had 60 to 70 less true raw in our builds at base because our weapons were weaker, and Crit I had not been buffed to have an extra 5% affinity at max level, we still preferred maxing out our critical modifier before we even thought about adding an attack boost or raw. And in Iceborne, attack skills are even weaker now because we have that 60 to 70 extra true raw in our weapons. And in case you're wondering if attack boost is going to be better for early game Iceborne when you're going through the story, that is also markedly untrue. This is actually a misconception I've seen going around quite a bit bit in the community. And I already despise misinformation, but misinformation spread to new players is even worse. They don't know any better and they're trusting you to give them accurate information as a veteran. Again, even in high rank, we preferred getting higher crit mod over adding raw into the build. Master rank weapons, even the base level master rank weapons, have higher raw than high rank weapons did. Which means that early master rank attack boost is even worse than it was in high rank. There is just no point during master rank that you should be focusing on attack boost over crit eye unless you're running a weapon that cannot crit. So that means that once we get critical eye 7, we get weakness exploit 3, and then we also get critical boost 3, we should just stick in attack boost 4 if we can fit it, right? Well, not necessarily. See, the thing is, if you can afford to fit it in instead, running Agitator 4 is significantly more preferable. See, even though Agitator did get nerfed in Iceborne, it also got significantly more buffed due to Enrage uptime timers. See, at level 4 Agitator, you now have 16 more attack and 7% more affinity when the monster is enraged. This is 4 more true raw as well as 2% more affinity than you get out of attack boost 4. And now in Iceborne, as soon as a monster is not enraged, you can just slinger burst them into a wall for free damage on the down as well as basically instantly enraging them. This puts your agitator uptime at like close to 90 to 95 percent. For all intents and purposes, the only time agitator should not be up is when the monster is down from you knocking them into a wall. Unless you're running TA plus clutch claw rules, in which case you cannot use flinch bursts, and then maybe, maybe you prefer attack boost. But wait, agitator is a level 2 skill and attack boost is a level 1 skill, so you can't really make them equivalent 
doesn't, can you? Well, yes and no, which is why I say if you can fit AG4 in, instead you should. So first off, Master Rank Armor is very lacking in level 1 deco slots. So very often you end up having the slot attack boost into a level 2 or higher deco slot anyway, or use an attack boost combo deco that you can get in the level 4 deco. Now in those level 2 deco slots, you can just slot an agitator. And in your level 4 deco slots, you can just slot in a combination agitator something else deco or a level 2 agitated deco instead. Assuming you have the choice of of course, but I'm fairly certain the double agitator deco is less rare than the double attack boost deco, but we haven't seen any table and roll numbers yet, so I'm not 100% on that. And then there's also the charm, so you can get an attack boost 4 charm now, which seems pretty good, but you can also get an agitator 4 charm, which is just better. So yeah, there are a lot of situations in which you can easily fit agitator 4 instead of attack boost 4, and it's just better. Pretty much now, the only time you're fitting in attack boost instead is if it's either more efficient than fitting in agitator or because you cannot fit agitator in it instead. And there are situations where you would rather have attack boost 4 and agitator 1 or 2 just so you can get that extra 10% affinity. But in some situations that isn't a choice and having attack boost 4 or agitator 4 is a choice and you should always be going with agitator. And remember, you're only going to fit either of these in after you get crit boost 3, critical i7 and weakness exploit 3 as well as whatever sharpness related skills you need for your particular weapon of choice. And for those of you wondering about peak performance, peak performance goes below both of these. Unless you're running something like a Naga Kuga weapon that has very high affinity, you're going to want to get the extra affinity out of either attack boost 4 or agitator 4 or 3 first. Peak was always the kind of skill, even in base Monster Hunter World, where you go, well, I can't really fit other stuff on here anymore, so I'll just throw Peak 3 on top of the set. And now it's even worse, because again, our true roll went up by 60 to 70. Not to mention it's trash without health augment, and you cannot get health augment on your weapons until really, really late game. But yeah, just to summarize, you generally want to focus on getting your critical modifier maxed out first, so that's going to be crit boost 3, weakness exploit 3, and crit i7 if you need that much. Now for elemental damage, this is a little weirder because you do want to have a high crit mod, but you also want to focus on having true critical element or critical elements. Crit boost 3 is still nice, but things like bow have a lot of other skills they want to fit in, like constitution, stamina surge, spread, and normal shot up and such, so you might not be able to fit in all the crit boosts you want. And of course, on these elemental builds, you want either elemental attack 3 or 6, generally 6 in late game, but 3 is enough for the earlier level weapons. But after you have all that critical modifier taken care of, then you can worry about fitting in more raw into your build because it's much less return on investment for damage. Alright, that's all I got for you on this video. Hopefully after all of this, you understand why attack boost is a trapped skill. And hopefully I'll stop seeing so many attack boost 7 builds that don't have any crit eye in them. Just to clarify, I'm not saying you have to run damage builds in this game. It's totally okay to run defensive or quality of life builds or whatever you find fun. The point of this video is to illustrate that if you are putting damage skills in your build, you need to focus on crit mod first. At least for non-fixed damage specific weapons, because things Things like Gun Lance and some Charge Blade builds get a little bit messier, but that's an entirely different topic. As always, thank you so much for checking out the video. I know this is a pretty dense topic, so I hope I explained it in a way you could understand and that it helped. If you have friends who would be interested in learning this information, be sure to share the video with them. And if this video did teach you something new, be sure to let us know by liking the video and leaving a comment below. It really does help. And thank you as always to Honey over at HoneyHunterWorld.com for creating and maintaining the tools we use to make sets. The updated builder for Iceborne is getting closer and closer, and we are very excited to use it. And if you'd like to find some like-minded hunters to hunt with on Iceborne or Monster Hunter World PC, check out our Discord server, The Mathless Nest. We do also have Iceborne-specific channels on there, so no risk of spoilers if you're not looking for those. We do, of course, also have a Twitter where we post updates about videos and various things that interest us, and Tuna has a Twitch where he streams almost every single day. He will be live as soon as the video goes live, so be sure to go show him some love. And of course, none of this is possible without the generosity of our patrons. And an especially huge thank you to our new patrons Palmito and Vangor82. All of you and your generosity have carried us all the way to the where we are today, so thank you so much. Alright, that's all I have for you on this one. Hopefully with all of this information, you now understand why Raw is relatively weak compared to Critical Modifier and Iceborne. Now we do have plenty more Iceborne content coming out because there is a lot to cover with the new expansion. So if you'd like to see those videos the moment they come out, as well as get notifications as soon as I live stream on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button as well as hit the notification bell. If you do not hit the notification bell, YouTube won't let you know when all of this stuff happens. Subscribe basically just means, hey YouTube, show me videos like this. Okay, thanks, bye. Alright, have a good one everyone. We'll see you in the next video. Bye!